So let me introduce uh, Ms. Maduria to you. Uh, she's a founder of A Canada Incorporation, United States. She's a registered Canadian immigration consultant authorized by the Government of Canada. And she provides immigration and citizenship advices to businesses, professionals, and students uh, who wants to go to Canada. She's also a member of Immigration Consultant and of Canada Regulatory Council and Canadian Association of Professional Immigration Consultant. So that means she is not a, uh, one of those touts who's going to put you in trouble. So she's authorized and she's recognized. So that way, she's reliable. You know, it's in the age of fake news. So something she can we can rely on. And prior to that, uh, she spent over a decade in uh, strategic and tactical roles in driving financial results in challenging corporate and manufacturing environments. Her experience as an internal and external management consultant in various leading global and U.S. companies spans the uh, automotive, healthcare, high-tech financial sectors, companies like uh, Mittal, McKesson, NetApp, Countrywide Financials, etc. Uh, apart from all these, she's a certified Six Sigma belt and uh, has a bachelor's in applied science and materials in metallurgical engineering from University of Toronto, Canada, and a master of engineering in operation research and industrial engineering from Cornell, USA. So we have somebody who not only highly qualified, but also hands-on experience with things. So I would welcome uh, Ms. Baduria. Please take over. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Everyone all up and ready? So the heat always gets to me, so I'm always impressed when other people are wide awake, because when I was in school, I'd always get tired if I saw the sun <laughs> outside. So thank you very much, for, first of all, uh, to the APJ community for having me here. I know that your time is very valuable, and I'm very honored by the fact that you have come here to hear me speak about Canada and the opportunities that are out there for you. Okay, so by the end of the talk, um, you know, I hope to provide you with, you know, an overview of post-secondary educational opportunities in Canada, um, and especially for, like, the foreign student body. And so one of the things, you know, that we're going to talk about is why Canada? I know that you all have a lot of different options. You know, there's India, there's Australia, there's the UK, and, of course, our favorite uh, big neighbor to the south, there's, you know, the uh, United States of America. Uh, and uh, so we're going to talk about why Canada, uh, about the Canadian education system. So what are your opportunities in post-secondary school um, and how do you, you know, match up, you know, the different credentials so that you're marketable down the road? Um, you know, what are some of the considerations? What should you be looking for when you look at, you know, studying anywhere actually, whether it's Canada, India, Australia, the U.S. or wherever? Um, and I'll talk to you about the process. How do you apply for, you know, university or postgraduate education in Canada? And then how do you go through the immigration process over there? Um, you know, there'll be a brief, you know, talk about, you know, our services, if you need any assistance. And then um, I'll be glad to take any questions that the people here may have. Uh, so let's get started. So I'm going to start off with why Canada? So uh, a lot of you may know that Canada, you probably learned this in grade school, Canada is the second largest country in the world. You know, but we have a very small population. We have 36 million people. It's nothing compared to the 1.3 billion people in India. So we've got you know, lots of space, so nice big homes, cheaper land, I can tell you that for sure. And um, you know, but our GDP, um, although it's not as good as India, it's only, you know, about half as that as India, but on a per capita basis, um, you know, we make some good money. So um, our unemployment rate, I always thought it was low, but then I saw the official Indian rates, but then I also hear Modi talking about we need to create more jobs. So I don't know if the rates that I got for India, if it really is 3.5%, because if it's 3.5%, that's amazing. Um, in Canada, we have to struggle a bit more and it's about 5.9% right now as of January 2018. Um, but the good news is uh, Canada scores really well on the corruption index is that we're not a very corrupt country. So you don't have to pay money to get things done. 
So uh, it's, uh, it's been an interesting experience for me that, oh, you know, if I want a telephone line, if I want my business registered. So it's like everybody wants a piece of me. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, you know, what's great is that you get to live longer. You get to live longer uh, and uh, in great health. So right now, if you move to Canada, you'll automatically gain, you know, about 10 plus years in your life. So why would people want to come to Canada? Is it the cold weather? So I love the weather here. It's awesome, right? It's about 25 degrees Celsius. It's not too cold at night. And uh, just for fun, because it always makes me feel better when I'm in India to look at what the weather's like in Canada. So this is what the temperature was um, across Canada back um, two days ago at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the warmest place in Canada, and I always wonder why my parents didn't immigrate there, is the west coast of Canada. So uh, Victoria, it's like a balmy four degrees Celsius. You know, Vancouver's even warmer. It's five degrees Celsius. I love that weather. I'm grateful when I see those numbers. Now, I'm from Toronto. That's where I grew up. And it's zero degrees Celsius. So we're just glad that it's not minus. Um, so Calgary, <laughs> minus 14 degrees. Regina, minus 10. Uh, if you go farther east, um, it's minus 101, which is a shocker because it's always a lot colder there. So, and they have winds like crazy. They come from the Atlantic. And uh, Yellowknife, Whitehorse, uh, Nineveh area, they're all like minus 24, minus 12, minus 19. So, are you going to come to Canada for the cold weather? Yes, let's be, be a little bit adventurous. You know, it's not cold if you bundle up. So, or are you going to come to Canada for the clean air? We've got the fifth cleanest air in the world. When I walk outside, I can take a deep breath. It's not like smoking five packs of cigarettes. It's like, that's what I'm told that Delhi air can be like. It's like 50 after Diwali, right? So you get all the uh, negative effects of smoking without any of the highs. So... Um, Canada, Canada, you know, you get all the benefits of the clean air. So, uh, where, um, I mean, it's just beautiful. This is from my uh, vacation in Quebec. So, this is not doctored, it was on my little cell phone. It's not an iPhone, so you know that this is actually much better than what it really is. So, you can go to Canada for the clean air, right? You may not care about it, but when you start having kids who are young, you don't want them to have asthma. Or do you want to go for clean water? So I was always told, when you go to India, don't drink the water from the tap. I don't know why they'd say that. How many people here drink water from the tap? Let's put our hands up. What? <laughs> Only one person? <laughs> Only one person. All right. I'm a tap water person. So. Uh, like Dr. Guru said, with less than 1% one, 1 of the world's population, Canada has more than 7% of its renewable water supply. So no other country has as much fresh water available as Canada. And we have more lakes than the rest of the world combined. You know, there's actually, for every 10 people, there's one lake in Canada. And that's counting only the lakes that are over three square kilometers in area. So if, you, so if you were to count the smaller lakes, it'd probably be one for every person. Like, I should have my own lake named after, you know, everybody in Canada should have their own lake, lake named after them. So um, it's a little bit interesting because in Canada, I just take the shower and just have a nice long shower. Here, I just uh, use a bucket. Sorry, I'll try to sp speak slower. Or do you have a question? Because of two hands, that's why I said two hands speak slower. No, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so when I came to India, I learned to drink bottled water. And only from the store. Don't buy it from the guy on the street. Okay. So let's talk about attitudes towards immigrants. So Canada is known for its multiculturalism. We have, you know, people from all around the world. Growing up, I had neighbors from every part of the world. It's one of the reasons why I'm great at geography <laughs> and world uh, politics. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, you can tell more about a country by its leaders, right? In Canada, our leaders go around the world, 
and they talk about how diversity is our strength. But then you have other leaders who go around and say, why do we get having all these people, you know, from shithole countries coming here? Why can't we get more people from Norway? So it's, uh, so, you know, it's up to you as to where you want to go. Do you want to go someplace where you'll be welcomed? Or you want to go someplace where you need to become Norwegian and eat uh, flat plates? So, uh, and the other, some of the other, you know, good things about Canada is that, you know, Canada always comes out in the top five for any good world ranking. So U.S. News and World Report in 2018 and their latest report, Canada came in second again. You know, it's always, you know, a bridesmaid, never a bride. <laughs> so they were number two um, in the world's rankings. Switzerland beat us, but I think it's because they have better weather than Canada. Canada ranked really low on the weather. Oh, okay. Um, so we ranked number one for quality of life, number three for education, and number two for immigration. So if you're thinking Switzerland versus Canada, how many people here know French? Ooh, that's impressive. Mon français est très mal. <laughs> and how many people here know Swiss? Swiss, anyone? All right, so Switzerland's probably not a good choice for you. So maybe second best will work for you. Um, the other thing to look at is that in terms of, you know, country reputation, Canada's always number one. It's like you can go anywhere in the world with that Canada backpack and with the Canadian maple flag, and people will be nice to you. They'll try to help you. I just love that about the world. Everybody, no matter where you go in the world, they all have a relative in Canada. And not an unhappy relative, but a happy relative. So they treat you well. So I've met a lot of Americans for some strange reason who always have the Canadian flag and I'm always asking them, so where are you from in Canada? And they're like, we're actually Americans. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so, so one of the things is that, and if you want to be happy, we're number seven. Now, if we had weather like India, nice and warm, we'd be number one. But, you know, sometimes, you know, the snow does get to be a little bit of a drag. So, um, it's, it's pretty fun. So, things that you should look at when you consider Canada is, why should you go or consider Canada as an option? Because I know you have many options. So, Canada, the quality of services, whether it's, you know, the education system or life in general, it's relatively affordable. It's the most affordable compared to the UK and the US and Australia. Um, they have a top-notch research system. All their universities are renowned for research. Some of the best you know, research in the world has come from Canada. We just don't advertise it because Canadians are nice and low-key. Um, we have um, a great campus lifestyle. People are friendly and we you know, help people and one another. We have a multicultural environment. So one of the advantages of that that most people won't talk about is we have some of the best food in the world. You want authentic Chinese, you'll get authentic Chinese. You want authentic Indian, you'll get it. Greek, Italian, it's great if you love food. Um, Canada's got a great international reputation and they have you know, a great career path for people who go and work there. And uh, the immigration, is actually a lot easier because Canada welcomes diversity. We welcome the world. So there are a number of different routes that you can come to Canada. So you know there are some temporary ways. So that you can come on a visitor visa as a tourist. You know visit that relative that you know in Canada. Um, go get a, you know you can study. Uh, you can work for a short term in Canada. And then you can also immigrate um, permanently, straight, uh, straight off. And so there are a number of different ways to do that. So there's a family class. So yeah, you can immigrate there if you have a cousin, but you can immigrate there if you have a closer relative. Um, the, we can um, open a business in Canada, so you can go there through the business route. Uh, you can find a job in Canada through the employment route. Uh, and then um, for the truly needy, uh, there is a refugee class, so people around the world who are in war-torn areas can come to Canada. 
So I'm going to talk to you about the Canadian education system. Does anybody have any questions about what I've gone over so far? So if somebody were to ask you why choose Canada, you'd be able to sort of give them a little mini lecture? All right, great. So Canada has a number of different post-secondary options. Uh, we have like, you know, peak countries all over the US. You know, we have colleges and we have universities. Our system is a little bit different in that um, our co colleges um, are primarily geared towards career training and trades, uh, and they give a lot of practical or hands-on training. Uh, so for apprenticeships, for like, you know, plumbers, electricians, but also as varied as, you know, for example, fashion design or um, computer animation. Some of the best computer animation is being done in Canada, in Vancouver and Toronto, and a lot of those people come out of the local college system because they have cutting edge advances over there and they have faculty. The faculty at the colleges are people who have practical experience. So it's, you know, not, it's, it's, it's a little different from a university, but it's its own path to success. Universities um, play a different role. They're, um, you know, they have a lot of academic and professional programs and they're more geared towards critical thinking independent learning and research. So for example, if you go to college, when you get out, you can go straight into a job and hit the ground running and you know, provide a return to the company. Um, when you go to university, you may not have had that opportunity for practical training. And so you know, there's a little bit of lead time. Uh, so there's like a different, uh, they're both good, they're both equally good, but they both are different paths to success. So colleges and universities, um, you have different options or credentials that you get from that. Uh, so in colleges, you may have a certificate to help you boost your education or your knowledge. So there are a lot of people who actually have been to university in Canada, and then they realize that, you know what, uh, we, you know, we're lacking um, you know, some practical training. And, and I'll give you an example from my own life. So um, I have, a, as it was mentioned, I have a, a bachelor's in applied science from the University of Toronto, which is called the Harvard of the North. And I graduated from their materials and metallurgical engineering program. But one of the gaps that I had in my education when I was working at a steel mill was that I, you know, I was great with the theoretical uh, stuff, like for example, the fracture toughness and you know, how do you roll steel and what are the properties that you get out of that but I wasn't very good at welding. And so one of the things that I was considering uh, was you know, taking um, a welding certificate from one of the local colleges where I was working in the US. Um, and I would have moved forward with that. It's just that um, if you work in a steel mill, they have shift work, and so it didn't work out with my schedule. But you know, colleges have um, you know, very good opportunities to you know, provide the practical experience that you may be, um, uh, you know, that you may be missing. Um, they also have two to three year diplomas. Uh, and then some colleges also provide um, bachelor degrees. And those also take three to four years of studying, or you can transfer to a university afterwards. Um, uh, now, and universities, of course, like universities here, they have um, bachelor degrees. They're usually three to four years. Four years is the more common um, option for degrees over there. Um, they have different types of master's degrees that can be one year or excuse me, um, two years, and some of them are professional master's degrees, and some of them are master's thesis based. Um, and then they also have um, doctorates, which you know, are three plus years. You do a lot of theoretical research um, that's very unique and is cutting edge um, that may be later applied to practical scenarios. So let me ask you all here, because I mean, it's been a long time since I was your age, like a very long time, fortunately. But I still remember all the angst as to, you know, what am I going to do with my life when I graduate? You know, where am I going to go next? I mean, how many people here, you know, have a clear understanding of their end goals? Let's, let's have a show of hands, right? How many people know what they're going to do when they're going to graduate? Okay, so we have, you know, two out of, you know, about 50 people. Um, which is great, by the way. So, um, and because uh, I'm, you know, one of the things that you should always look at is, you know, what are my end goals when I graduate? You know, your parents or you, you know, pay so much money for your education. 
what are you going to do you know, with it when you leave you know, this contained environment and go out into the world, right? So you have to look at when you're considering another course of studies uh, when you leave the university, you, know, you need to figure out, should I get a master's or a PhD? Um, and so that that will let me, if I get a master's, then I can always go and get my PhD down the road. Or, you know, would I want to join a trade profession? Or do I just want to augment my current skills, right? Do I want to become a better, you know, uh, fashion designer? Do I want to become a better journalist or a better, um, you know, animator? Um, or, you know, do I want to change careers? You know, the days of working for one company are long gone. Studies have shown that, you know, nowadays people who are in college now are going to have at least five different careers. And one of the ways to help move from one career to another is to go back to school and get the knowledge that you need to plug in that gap. So I'm just curious, like how many, where are the students um, here? Like what are you all studying? Just, are, are, do we have a lot of people from, you know, the sciences or from the arts department? It's a mixed crowd. It's a mixed crowd? Okay. So I, right now I was... Um, I wasn't sure, so I've been focusing on some of the uh, fashion and, uh, you know, arts, but I can sort of gear it more towards engineering and sciences. Um, so some of the things that you should be looking at when you look at, you know, the school is, you know, well, I have my end goals. How, you know, what are the considerations? What should I be looking at when it comes to my end goals, right? So you need to look at the program. Any program that I select, is it going to help me? you know, meet my end goal? Or is it just going to be a nice fancy certificate that I paid a lot of money for to put up on my wall? Are you going to be able to use it? Um, what's the reputation of the school that I went to? Right? Where, you know, does that, you know, but then there's also transferability. If I go to that school and it's not a good fit or I don't like the program or I want to transfer a different program, will I be able to transfer the work that I've already done to another program? You know, and last but not least is cost. I don't know about you, but I don't have a rich uncle to pay my way, so I always have to look at money. Um, and it's like, am I paying for this? Am I going to get a return on this? You know, when I graduate, am I going to be able to get a job, right? Because I want to be able to get a job. Can't live at my parent in my parents' house forever. Need to move out sometime. So uh, can I get a job so then I can get my own place and you know move into adulthood? It's kind of hard to do that when you don't have any money coming in, right? And then the other piece of it is culture, right? Am I going to fit in to where I'm studying? Um, or am I going to be miserable because it's not a good fit for me? This is not the culture and the environment for me. You know, uh, the environment, right? Some people don't like the cold. You know, if you can't stand the cold, if you don't like Uttarakhandar or Ladakh, then, you know, you may need to consider that Canada is usually pretty cold for about three to six months of the year, depending on where you're at. However, if you're not afraid of new things, you can always bundle up and have a lot of fun. You know, we have curling. It's the most exciting sport in the world. Hockey, which is a little bit more boring. You know, we go ice skating and we go skiing. Sorry, what was that? Snowboarding. Snowboarding, Snowboarding and skiing. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, fun things to do in the cold. Or you can do what a lot of other people do, is that they stay home with the central heating on and they just watch Netflix. So. Uh, and then uh, we have, um, you know, very welcoming immigration policy. So if you go to Canada and go to school there, it becomes a lot easier for you to immigrate to Canada. So I talked about these issues before. So again, you know, the program, does the institution where I'm going, do they have the program that I'm looking for? You know, will you know, the reputation of the school help me get the, uh, into the choice, uh, get me my choice of company or field? And remember, it's not the school's overall reputation. I always see the, oh, well, what's the school's rank? You know, is it number one? Is it number two? Well, I, even if, you know, Harvard had a computer science program, well, Yale does, but a lot of people don't go to Yale to recruit computer science people. You know, they'll go to Carnegie Mellon. You know, in Canada, you can go to University of Toronto, which has, is a great overall school and has the best, I'm a little bit biased because I went there, but they have the best reputation overall. But if you're going to do computer engineering or computer science, maybe University of Waterloo is a, you know, a better choice. Or if you have a specialty or an interest in computer um, 
hardware, such as ASIC design, you might be better off going to Simon Fraser University um, because they have a professor there who's doing some really great work over there. For fashion, you might be better off going to Ryerson for journalism Carlton. So a lot of students make this mistake. They're like, well, what's the overall ranking of the school? Quite frankly, who cares? Is the school, does the school have the reputation and does it do um, give you, um, you know, the connections that you need to get uh, into your career choice? And that's what you should be looking at when you look at reputation. Um, transferability, so, you know, one thing you might want to look at, you've already gone, you know, you're already doing a bachelor's here. Will I be able to transfer credits in the future or will I have to redo some of these courses, right? You don't want to do double work. It's boring and it costs money. Um, how much will it cost, right? And let's just say it costs a lot of money. Will I be able to get my money back, right? So how many years will it take for me to make my money back? You know, there was a point in my career where I was looking at, should I get an MBA? But, you know, I looked at the return on investment and I was like, you know, I already, ha you know, making that salary, you know, what's the point of going to B school and spending 100000 you know, when I'm already making a six-figure salary? I'm not going to get that, you know, a large enough shift. And so you need to consider that, that, you know, am I going to be able to make up this money if I go to this program? Some programs may be very cheap, and it may cost you, you know, like let's say $5,000. Another program may be 50000 but if the $50,000 job, you can, um, tuition, you can make up in one year, versus a 5,000, it's gonna take you four years, you're better off paying a little bit more, or sometimes a lot more, because you get your return on investment. Oh, sorry, and then you have to look at employability. So one of the things that you need to look at is, you know, will I get my job um, that I want? And then more importantly, what is the placement rate, you know, for graduates from my program? And this is very hard. You will talk, you hear a lot of universities say, oh, we've got a great school, we've got a great, you know, uh, program. But you know what? Show me the money, right? How many of you people have, act, how many of your students actually have jobs in that field versus just having jobs and they're working, you know, in retail when that's not their field of interest and that's not why they went to school? The other um, issue is that, well, is the culture a good fit for me? And... Uh, you have to sort of look at that when you look at different schools. Some school campuses have 300 students in a class. Some have 20. Which one is the right one for you and your learning style, right? Some universities, they have, you know, a thousand students in some of their classes. You know, that's just the way it is. And you have to do a lot of independent work on your own. You know, the professor's not going to be able to meet with you. Your, you know, your assignments are being marked by the teaching assistant. Um, if you go to a smaller university or a college, you know, they may be able to provide you with, you know, the learning structure that, you know, will help you learn the best. So they only have, let's say, 20 or 30 students in a class. You know, the professors are very responsive. Uh, and it's just, you know, they're just different, and you have to figure out what's best for you. Um, another um, issue to look at is, you know, the environment. Um, again, uh, you know, every institution has its own, you know, physical idiosyncrasies. Some, you know, like, I wish I went to, like, UBC, University of British Columbia, because the weather there is great all year. Um, I'm also glad that I didn't go to the East Coast, because it's a lot colder for me. Um, but you know what, though? I know people who, they love the East Coast. You know, Newfoundland has more moose than people. It's gorgeous over there. Uh, but then if, you know, if, you're, if you love seafood, you want to go to Newfoundland. So there are good, for every place, there are good things to think about and there are thing, not so good things. And what you need to figure out is what is the right environment for you? Do you like the campus? Can you live there without being miserable? You know, and you, you know, is it, you know, is it you? And then with immigration, you have to think about, you know, well, I'm spending all this money to study in Canada. You know, when I graduate, will I be able to work in Canada? How is it easy is it to do that? You know, if I work in Canada, how easy will it be for me to immigrate to Canada down the road? After all, you know, I'm spending three years or, you know, after graduation working here. You know, I have, you know, a fa you know either established a family or I bought a condo or all my friends are here. Will I have to go back after three or six years? Uh, right now, we have a situation in the U.S. where... They have a limit per country as to how many people can immigrate. So, you know, they have a limit on H-1Bs, 
And they're only renewable twice for a three-year period each, so a maximum of six years. Uh, and right now they're making it a lot harder to renew. And then if you're lucky enough and you are able to get a green card, because there's a backlog for green cards, you know, if you have a bachelor's degree, I think right now you have to wait about 15 years to be able to get your green card. Well, let's just say you get your green card. You know, right now there's a backlog of 67 years or more to be able to get, you know, your citizenship because the U.S. has a quota per country quota, and it affects five countries. You know, the number one country that it affects is India. So you have this terrible situation where you have what's called legal dreamers, people who grew up in the U.S. because their parents were there on work visas. All they know is the U.S., but they don't have a pathway to legal status in the States, right? And that's totally different from Canada, where, you know, if you work there, then you're, you know, valued. Your contribution to our workforce and, you know, supporting the economy of Canada is very well appreciated, and we want you to stay in Canada. And so we encourage immigration to Canada. So if you go to school in Canada, if you work in Canada, it's, you know, um, you know, we want you to stay there. And what makes it really interesting um, and different from a lot of other countries is that if you happen to be married, so some of you might be married, uh, your spouse, if you're studying for, let's say, three years, your spouse can get a work permit for three years. There's no fuss, no muss. You know, if you get a work permit for, you know, one year or three years, your spouse can get a work permit, and there are no restrictions. Right now, there are very few countries that have that. Uh, the U.S. under Obama, you know, implemented um, allowing spouses to work under an H-4 visa a couple of years ago, and Trump is very strongly against, uh, against that. So they will be removing that feature shortly. So one of the challenges people might have is, how do I pay for my education in Canada? Well, if you happen to be married, your husband can work. They can find a job, and they can help support you. If you, you know, um, or your wife can find a job and support you if you're studying. So it's, it's, um, there are a lot of opportunities for people in Canada. So does anyone have any questions about you know, what they should consider when they look at Canadian immigration, um, Canadian universities, you know, how it fits into your end goals? Because quite frankly, I'm going to try to move up. So the good score is B for India. So it's a B pass. So they need to, um, I think it's called first class. Um, so it depends on the university. So over here, I mean, I'll get into that. But they need to have the uh, universities um, evaluated. Your degree is evaluated. And then your score is translated into the equivalent of a Canadian um, university score. So as we know, um, you know, all schools in India are not created equal. So some of them, you know, I can open up my own school, uh, apparently. Uh, some, um, you can have online schools and different types of schools. Um, one of the great things about uh, the, um, the university here is that it's a four-year bachelor's degree, and Canada recognizes four-year four um, four degrees. Uh, if you have a three-year degree, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get um, into any um, post-grad program. The schools there usually tend to make you um, complete another extra year to get that fourth year. So uh, you're actually being done a great service by um, APJ Stia University because they're providing you with an undergraduate uh, education that is very rigorous that involves four years um, of undergrad. And I've looked at your course curriculum and it's, it's good, so it'll hold up. Um, but it just needs to be evaluated by one of the uh, six agencies that evaluate educational qualifications. Um, but one of the things is, you know, I always go back to people, and it's like you always need to figure things about what are your end goals. So I ask all of you, um, whenever you're looking at going back to school or even, you know, for your career search or your job search, always, look, look, you know, understand where you want to end up because if you don't have um, a goal, it's going to be a lot harder for you to achieve it. And that's for anything in life, right? You know, what type of house do I want? What type of job do I want? You know, what type of spouse do I want? <laughs> so it applies everywhere. 
So um, let's look at the admissions process in Canada. So, you know, the first thing again, like what you should do is figure out, you know, what program you want and what, what DLI, uh, DLI you should go to. Now, who here knows what DLI means? No, I didn't think anyone would, but um, it's always interesting to see the acronyms you can come up with. Um, DLI in this case stands for Designated Learning Institution. So uh, Canada has many different colleges and universities, uh, and some of them, you know, on, you know, only some of them will allow you to get um, a work uh, a study permit, and only some of them will allow you to have a work visa after you graduate. Um, and the reason why is that they have some schools that are for, like, for example, ESL English schools that are catered to people who come from overseas to study for six months to improve their English skills. Um, they have some trade schools like hairdressing school um, and um, esthetician schools or, you know, other small schools like that. And, you know, the Canadian government doesn't feel that, um, you know, people cannot learn these skills in their home country. So uh, when you go to a school in Canada, you should make sure that it's a designated learning institution. Canada has over 8,000 programs at over 135 publicly funded colleges and universities that are designated learning institutions all across the country. So you wanna make sure you're going to the right place. Uh, the other thing that you need to do is make sure you meet all the prerequisites and the deadlines. So every program is unique. You know, if you go to law school, engineering school, um, fashion school, computer school, doesn't matter what your program is, or, um, they'll be unique. They'll have different requirements, and they'll have different requirements for the same program across universities, because every university has a different intake process. So you want to make sure that you review all those and you have a good understanding. And then last but not least is the deadlines. How many people are you know, always doing things at the last minute with their homework or with their life? Like, I mean, I'm a little bit of a procrastinator. All right, only 10%. This is an extremely conscientious class I have of students, and you're so young, too. <laughs> All right. Well, as a procrastinator, I'm going to tell you, don't do it, because it's hurt me so much in life. So if you do the same thing when you're looking at studying at schools over abroad, you're going to miss out, because the universities have very strict deadlines. So the dog ate my homework will not work for them. You know, my, you know, second cousin, third removed is having their wedding is not going to work for them. They will not extend the deadline for anything. You know, there's no, you know, the only exception is an act of God, but you don't want an earthquake to happen in Delhi to, you know, just so that you can extend your deadline. So, so make sure you look at the deadlines because that's very key. Uh, especially because coming from India, there are a lot of extra steps that you okay, need to go stuff, through. Please, we have a speaker here. Please maintain silence. So there are a lot of extra steps you have to go through and watch out for. Um, it's not as easy as if you were coming from the U.S. So one of the things that you have to do as part of that is take a language proficiency test. So I, I realize that uh, India has English as one of its official languages. Uh, but for some reason, uh, when I speak English, people don't understand me here. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting phenomena. And, uh, you know, what the schools and the Canadian government want to do is to make sure that when you come to Canada, you are set up for success. And one of the ways that they do that is making sure that you'll be able to interact with, you know, not just your classmates or your professors, but also with the world at large, because at the end of the day, Canada wants you to live there. We only have 35 million people. We can use you know, a couple of hundred million people that are here in India. Um, and so um, you have to account for time for the language proficiency test. You have to gather your academic credentials and get them certified. So there are things that you have to do, such as get you know, an official copy of your mark sheet, uh, your syllabus, and uh, your uh, transcript uh, in English. If it's not in English, you need to get them certified, and then you need to send them to one of the um, six, uh, you know, uh, worldwide uh, education credential verification services that the Canadian government accepts. 
One of the other things that you need to then do, once you have all these things, is that you need to apply for admission and pay an application fee. So in Canada, you can apply to all the universities and colleges, but you're gonna to have to pay around 10,000 rupees to 15,000 rupees per application. So again, if you have a rich uncle, you can do that, all right? Um, but you know, if you're like most of us, and you don't have a rich uncle, you wanna consider which school and program is the best fit for you and allocate your resources accordingly. Does that make sense so far? Does anybody have any questions? Burning questions, no? Okay, um, so you do all that and you know, you open the mail or your email nowadays and you receive the offer letter and you're like, this is great, you know, I got accepted into the program of my choice that will help me achieve the goals I want in life. So what do you do? You don't just sit on it, you're like, send the reply back and I accept your offer. But the universities and colleges are smart, so you have to give a little small deposit to make sure that you're serious. Um, and so this deposit is usually around 50,000 rupees or so um, as a down payment. Um, and the only time you usually get that back is if your study permit was rejected. So then you know, once you get the um, offer letter and you accept, uh, you need to apply for and then hopefully receive the study permit. And then after that, you pay your tuition fees, you know, you go to Canada, and you have you know, a life where, yes, it's cold, but you get a lot of clean water, and you get a lot of clean air, and it's a lot of fun. So just to give you an idea for those procrastinators among us, what you have to sort of consider is that if you're looking to apply in university, most of the programs start in September. So the school year in Canada runs usually from September to um, April, and you get usually May to uh, August off. So it's a little different from other, you know, other countries. And so if you wanna hit the September you know, main admission deadline, you need to apply in January. You know, um, and that's the deadline. So ideally, um, admission you will usually open up three months earlier, so they'll open up in October. You wanna get your admission, um, your application in as soon as possible because like everything else in life, there are limited amount of seats. And what the university will do is that they'll look through their applications and they'll look at the, you know, the cream of the crop and then they'll take those people first. And if you set your, put, submit your application you know, in January or December, you run the risk that there won't be enough open spots left uh, so where that you can attend the university and program of your choice. You know, if you're looking at the spring session, you know, it's not that common where universities will accept people mid-year, some of them will. Um, you're looking at deadlines around September. So, um, and again, this is like four or five months, and again, it's the deadline, it's the last date. You don't wanna be a procrastinator, you wanna apply almost as soon as they open up. And then for the summer session, it's November. Now, the good thing about colleges is that, you know, they have a little bit more flexibility and so you can apply a little bit later. So a lot of college deadlines for the fall session is usually you know, in March, so you get a couple more months leeway. So if you're a procrastinator and you're like, I have my set heart set on going to this university, you need to then, you know, and you miss the deadline, but you really want to study and you don't want to sit out your year, then you may want to consider Canadian colleges because they have a later application deadline. And uh, they have a lot more programs where you're not just limited to the fall session to enrolling. You have the option of you know, enrolling in a spring session or even a summer session. So you have a little bit more flexibility. Um, but one of the things that you need to consider is that it takes at least 10 days you know, to get your academic credentials uh, you know, verified. And that's if you have everything. So if you're one of those people who's super organized and is able to follow instructions and you don't need to worry about it being sent back because you know, there was a mistake on it, then you know, it's only gonna take you about 10 days. Um, same thing with the English proficiency test, right? If you're signing up for IELTS or TOEFL, um, you're, um, you know, they're a lot less, uh, um, it takes about two weeks to register and that's if you're not preparing. So I've been told to move it up, so I'm gonna start speaking a little bit faster, so pardon me. Um, but you know, here's some you know um, idea, here's an idea of the average tuition figure for international students. It's a lot higher than um, 
you know, what they have uh, for local students. Uh, so, and these are all Canadian dollars. So, you know, one Canadian dollar is about 50 rupees. So that kind of gives you an idea as to how much they, it costs. So anywhere from, if you go to Newfoundland, it's $9,000. Ontario, it's 24 on average. And I can tell you that since 2015, those figures have gone up. Um, for the English proficiency tests, you know, schools have their own. So if your English is weak, they might put you in a special program. Um, but they do charge you extra for that, and it will cost you an extra you know, semester um, if you take their English program. So if you can show that you can meet these English proficiency test uh, benchmarks, then you're actually in a good place. So um, I'm going to quickly go over the student permit process. So, you know, once you get the letter of acceptance from the, from the designated learning institution, you want to make sure you have a valid passport um, that doesn't expire until after your projected end of your program. So if you have a three-year program or four-year program, you want to make sure that your passport doesn't expire for at least three or four years, because otherwise, you know, they may refuse your application or they'll just give you a study permit for that period and then you're going to have to apply again and it's going to cost you more money. You're going to have to apply for a new passport anyway. Um, you need to make sure that you, know, you provide you know, your English proficiency documents and the academic credentials because they want to make sure there's no fraud taking place. Uh, you have to show sufficient funds for tuition and living. And the definition of that is you need to have enough money for one year's worth of tuition plus an additional $10,000 in cost for yourself. If your spouse is coming with you, then it's an additional 5000 and then for each person after that, it's 4000 So if you have children or anyone else is coming with you who's a dependent. Um, and then they also want to see is um, income tax returns. Canada doesn't like people who get their money illegally because they tend to think it comes from criminality. So it would be great if you had income tax returns that could prove that the money did come from a legitimate source and not from a drug dealer or an arms dealer because Canada doesn't want those. Um, you also have to obtain a police report and uh, complete the immigration forms and you need to apply for a study permit and because Canada is, I mean India is not a visa exempt company, country, you also need to apply for a temporary resident visa. Um, you should also get your health exam because India is one of those countries where you do have to get a metal, medical exam. They check for things like TB, etc. And then you, know, you have to submit that application all together. And so the processing time you know, for student permits is about five weeks. But what happens is that um, you know, the you know, Indian consulate is a little bit funny. Sometimes they might say that if you don't submit your application at least three months before, don't count on getting it. So if you send it, like right now it's five, five weeks, but if you send it in exactly five or six weeks, you know, they may just look at it and say, you know what, we're going to get to that at the end because we have some others and they shouldn't have sent it. And especially if you get close to September, there are going to be more applications you know, getting in. It's like when you go to work during rush hour, you know, if you go to work two hours early, there's going to be less traffic on the road, so it's going to take you less time to get to work. But if you go right before work is starting, then you know, there's going to be more traffic and it's going to increase your commute time. So you need to account for that. Um, the medical exam can take about four weeks for those results to be processed, so you want to make sure you leave time for that. And you also want to make sure that you leave time for getting the police report. Right now, India says that it takes three weeks, but you know what, it might get hung up somewhere unless you pay a little bit of money to grease the wheels or something, so you need to keep uh, that. So um, just to wrap it up, so uh, we talked about you know, my company, so it's A Canada, and we differentiate ourselves because you know, we are authorized by the Canadian government, we come from a business background, and we know what you need to succeed in today's work environment. And we have offices in Toronto and Winnipeg, um, the US in Austin, San Francisco, and Delhi, um, and the ones, some of these are going to be opening soon. Um, so, for example, in India, I have to get permission from the Royal, uh, Reserve Bank of India to open a business. Uh, so, you've already heard about me. Uh, and some of the services that we provide are um, counseling. So, if you don't have an idea of what your end goal is, we can help you figure it out and what's the best program for you. And we'll help you with your applications and getting into the program of your choice. Um, same with immigration. We'll help you with your ter uh, ter temporary visas, with your study permit, with your work permit. Uh, one thing that you may not realize is that Canada allows students to work um, up to 20 hours per week off campus during the school year and during the summer and any um, school breaks, scheduled school breaks, you're allowed to work full time. So one of the things that can help you um, offset your cost of fees is that you, know, they, um, you can work part-time um, or during the summer. 
Uh, one of the things that we also help for people who are totally new to Canada and need to, you know, climatize is the facilities, the housing, day-to-day -day living, and job search. Um, and last, you know, I just want to let you know that, you know, you could use um, ghost consultants, but one of the things that you need to watch out for is that the Canadian government, sab kuch nahi chalta hai, right? They're very strict about your rules. So if you say that, if you use a consultant who's not registered, then your application may be cancelled or rejected. And it's gone so far that people who have gotten their Canadian citizenship have had it stripped. So these are things that you should consider when you're looking at somebody to help you. Um, I've just put some fun facts about Canada. Um, you know, for example, Alberta claims to be the only place in the world that doesn't have rats. Anybody who struggled with rats? Um, if you, um, you know, 50% of the immigrants are the millionaires in Canada are children of immigrants or immigrants. So they have the most intergenerational income mobility in the world. We get an A rating on that. And then for, I've heard about the Indian work schedule. So in Canada, less than 4% of people work greater than 50 hours a week. We don't work Saturday and Sunday. I'm always shocked to find that people do that here. And the hours there are closer to 9 to 5, not what I've been told, like 10 to 8 or, you know, I've heard some crazy hours from people here. I'm like, how many hours do you work a week? So anyway, I just want to ask, does anybody here have any questions? Thank you so much for having me. I realize that you made some of you late for your class, so I appreciate your patience.